This is Patty Brennan. I'm the director of the National Library of Medicine. Welcome to the first Ada Lovelace Computational Health Lecture Series. I'd like to turn the podium over to my colleague, David Landsman, who is the scientific associate, deputy scientific director for the computational biology branch at the National Center for Biotechnology Information within the NLM. David. Thanks, Patty. Um, so, uh, I'd like to introduce why we chose this name and give you a few words. But if you look to Ada Lovelace up in the Encyclopedia Britannica, you will find that Ada Lovelace in full, Ada King, Countess of Lovelace, her original name was Augusta Ada Byron, Lady Byron, and she was born in December 1815 in London, England. She died in 1850, November 1852, also in London. Um, and goes on to say that she was an English mathematician and associate of Charles Babbage, for whose prototype of a digital computer she created a program. She has been called the first computer programmer. So, Ada Lovelace was only 36 years old when she passed, yet she has long been known for being the first computer programmer. I find this a remarkable achievement on more than one account, and you'll hear more. Ada, I'll quote again, Ada Lovelace discovered that a computer could follow a sequence of instructions that is a program, that is a program. In her writings about Charles Babbage's proposed computer, the analytical engine, she showed that the computer could follow a series of steps to make complex calculations, and she speculated that such programs would work with other things besides number. I can hear all the AI and machine learning people chuckling right now. She certainly was a very early prophet of the computer age. Ada married in 1838 and became the Countess of Lovelace when her husband was created an earl. Ada Lovelace was the daughter of Annabella Mulbank Byron and Lord Byron, who were legally separated two, or two months after she was born, and she never saw him again. Why do I mention this? Because I think that Annabella must have been an extraordinary mother as she quote, coached her daughter on a variety of very challenging topics, including mathematics, and managed to obtain for her several tutors in, in mathematics, including Augustus de Morgan. I think that Annabella was way ahead of her time in inviting her daughter in, into an environment that was dominated by men, totally dominated by men at the time. Even today, in 2020, this is a major lesson to be learned. Encourage your daughters and your sons to be active learners in STEM at all levels, and especially early on. Ada, the early programming language, was named for her. And the second Tuesday in October has become Ada Lovelace Day, on which the contributions of women to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics are honored. I suggest we have the next or future Ada Lovelace lecture on October the 13th, 2020. Fittingly, the name for this lecture series was suggested by Teresa Pshititska, a computer scientist at NCBI's Computational Biology Branch in the NLM's Intramural Research Program. Furthermore, NLM has had several ongoing speaker series in computational biology and biomedical informatics and related areas. Ada Lovelace lecture series will bring these together and emphasize NLM's research, fo research focus on computational innovation across biomedical research as a means toward improved health and a better understanding of biology. This will interweave the researchers at the NLM Intramural Research Program with those in the extramural programs as well as the broader NIH research community. I look forward to today's speaker, John Holmes, the first Ada Lovelace Computational Health Lecture Series speaker. It is a pity that we are doing this as a webinar, but I look forward to meet in person one day. Dr. Holmes will be introduced by Valerie Florence. Over to you, Valerie. Actually, David, I think I'm doing the introduction here. Not a problem. <laughs> Um, this is Patty Brown. Uh, I'm director of the National Library of Medicine and Valerie's boss. She assigned me to this job. Um, it, it gives me great pleasure, first of all, to have this lecture being launched. And I thank David Landsman and his colleagues in the Intramural Pro Research Program at the National Library of Medicine for thinking of this very creative and important way to shape science and society in one conversation. There's no one more fitting for the first lecturer within the Ada Lovelace Computational Health Series than Dr. John Holmes. Dr. Holmes is with the Department of Biostatistics, Epidemiology, and Informatics at the University of Pennsylvania, Perlman School of Medicine. He holds the rank of full professor, as well as the associate director for the Penn Institute for Biomedical Informatics. 
Dr. Holmes also was past chair of the graduate group in epidemiology and biostatistics. He's nationally recognized and internationally recognized for his work in applying new artificial intelligence approaches to mining epidemiological surveillance data. I'm proud to call him a colleague and a friend. We've had many discussions over the years, and as I watched our field of biomedical informatics embrace new and more advanced analytic technologies, John was certainly in the forefront of testing those out, of determining where they fit and where they did not fit, and gave us lots of insights to better understanding data. His research interest in, are focused on the intersection of medical informatics and clinical research, specifically evolutionary computation and machine learning approaches to knowledge discovery in clinical databases, deep electronic phenotyping, interoperable information systems infrastructure for epidemiological surveillance, and their application to a broad way of, array of clinical domains, including cardiology and pulmonary medicine, and as you will hear today, the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic. John is a tireless servant of the fields across epidemiology and biomedical informatics. He co is, has served as the co-lead for the governance core of the SPAN project, a scalable distributed research network. He participates in the FDA Sentinel Initiative. He, he's an elected fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics, the American College of Epidemiology, and most recently, the International Academy of Health Sciences Informatics. John has been also a wonderful friend and supporter of the National Library of Medicine, having served on some of our federal advisory committees. And it is with my great pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. John Holmes, scholar, friend, and leader. Thank you, John, and welcome. Thank you so much, Patty. It's a real pleasure to be here. I am extremely honored to be the, uh, the inaugural speaker of, the, of this wonderful series. Thank you, David, for initiating it. And thank you, Patty and Valerie, uh, actually, for asking me um, to, to uh, present this, this uh, talk. So um, I just wanted to put this into a little bit of perspective here. And I'm going to pepper through my presentation with some slides um, from the history. Um, that we have to uh, really think about here in terms of a pandemic and in terms of how our computational approaches to dealing with epidemics in the past and currently, of course, the big pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic that we're dealing with right now. Um, so the, our history, American history, uh, it goes back quite a bit in dealing with um, whole issues with plagues and and um, epidemics. This is the Philadelphia Lazaretto, which is a, uh, a quarantine hospital that was built in the 18th century, uh, right along the Delaware River, just not too far south of the Philadelphia airport. Um, it's quite a quite an interesting uh, structure. It's under a lot of, uh, of uh, renovation right now. But this is where uh, people coming in on ships, actually, once they past the quarantine um, would be staged here to if, if, if they needed medical care. Um, so others would just stay on board ship for the 40 days. That, that's where uh, the word quarantine comes from. Uh, it's Italian for, uh, it has an Italian root. So just a little bit of an outline. Um, I, I want to go over some preliminaries to make sure that we're all pretty much on the same page with what COVID-19 is about, as if we haven't heard enough over the past uh, weeks and months at this point. Um, and then I want to talk about a bit about the data sources and data integration. So I'm, you know, an informatician at heart, um, and we can't stop uh, without, we can't actually start uh, thinking about computation without thinking about the data and how we're going to integrate them, because you'll see that they come from a variety of different sources. And then we can dive into the computational tools. And I thought it would be interesting to start with the traditional modeling approaches, um, including the epidemic curve, which I know you all have seen at this point. It comes up on the news very frequently. Um, but also talking a bit about the compartment models um, and the way we, we uh, calculate uh, uh, contagion and spread. And then uh, we're going to get into the heart of the talk, which is the novel approaches to pandemic modeling, novel approaches that use uh, new applications of statistical methods, uh, machine learning methods, social media mining, which is coming to uh, uh, real fruition, I think, in this, in this day of COVID, and uh, agent-based models, and then a bit of a summary. So some preliminaries. Um, just to remind you all that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a novel coronavirus that hasn't been seen before, uh, before the outbreak in Wuhan, China. Um, but it is similar, of course, to other SARS uh, and, and MERS. Um, but COVID-19 is not the virus. But we, we think of COVID-19 as actually the disease that's caused by it. And uh, it was recent, fairly recently determined by the WHO to be a pandemic. 
So some features, uh, for most people, it causes few, if any, symptoms, uh, as many as 70% that we found in Italy. And I should mention, by the way, that I'm currently on quarantine because I just returned from, from six months in Italy um, just this past Monday. And um, so I'll be here for uh, until July 1. <laughs> and I don't have it, but if I did have it, I might not know it because we found in Italy that actually as many as 70% of those testing positive on the um, the PCR, the, the, the polymerase chain reaction test, uh, it were actually, they were positive, but they were as asymptomatic. For many, it resembles a flu-like syndrome that can cause up to two weeks of illness, and I know some people who have had that, and it's very, very unpleasant, um, but it's still recoverable. But for others, the disease can be very devastating, as you know. Um, it cre can create a cytokine storm, um, which throws your immune system into complete disarray, resulting in a cascade of system compromise involving the lungs, uh, the heart, the kidneys, and the um, uh, uh, just about everything else in the body, too, but especially the... Um, uh, the uh, hematologic systems. And, you know, a friend of mine at Penn actually said it is a very strange disease because it has so many different manifestations and a very interesting course. So where we are globally, um, you all probably know this website. If you don't, um, I would strongly suggest you copy and paste the, the URL here. Um, this is from the Johns Hopkins um, Coronavirus Resource Center. Very interesting site, which allows you to explore visually uh, what, what is going on with with uh, COVID globally, and also right down to the state and even the city level. You can you can drill down over here by country, and over here you can drill down by state, and then within state, certain selected cities. And down here at the bottom is the epidemic curve, and we'll talk a lot more about that in, in just a minute. But over here, you can see. This map right here shows where there are reported cases of COVID-19. And I was over here in Italy, and um, that was the first red spot besides over here in China and Wuhan. So some data sources. On the patients who get hospitalized, there is, there is a surfeit of data, to say the least. There is ongoing clinical assessments usually found in the clinical notes. So there's a great opportunity for natural language processing. Um, but on top of that, there are a lot of structured data, too. There's pulse oximetry, um, radiography, which is more than just the notes. It could also be the, the images as well, so lots of images to mine, for example. Um, a, a plenty of labs, certainly blood gases for respiratory function, chemistry, hematology, and coagulation in particular. Um, the, uh, of course, the administration of oxygen, whether a patient has been intubated, et cetera. There are so many different uh, sources and types of data here, which cause us in the informatics world uh, a certain degree of um, anxiety, I guess. But there's more to it than that. This is Italy, and these maps right here or th that you see embedded in the country, these are the regions, and this is Lombard Lombardy, um, which is where I was. I was down here in a town called Pavia, the University of Pavia. And the problem with this area is, is primarily geographical. Um, the Apennines extend around here on the west coast. And then up here you have the Alps. Switzerland is right here. And southern France is right over here. Um, as a result, there's a large basin effect. And as a result of that, you get a lot of thermal inversions where you get these wet, foggy autumns and early winters and hot, summits, hot humid summers. And then on top of that, you get population density. Lombardy is the most densely populated uh, region. And by the way, a region corresponds to a state in the US. Um, the, the, the density here is very high. Uh, it's, it's about 12 million, um, which is about 20% of the population of the entire country. And you know Milan is there, um, so and that's that's the largest city in in Italy, um, and there are plenty of little towns around there which contribute to uh, the density as well. And as a result of all this, there's an incredible amount of, of um, pollution, mostly from airborne particulates, um, and throughout much of the southern part of Europe in particular. And there is probably a very high rate of chronic lung disease. Uh, we know that there is from what's been documented, and we do know that that is a potential risk factor for why. The, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the mortality rate in Lombardy has been so uh, devastating. And there's more. There are plenty of nursing homes in Lombardy, um, just like there are in the U.S. And there were two nursing homes that had a spectacular number of deaths. Um, it, it, there were up to 50% up, up to of the COVID-related deaths occurred in or from nursing homes. So that's a remarkable uh, feature, and I think that we see nursing homes now as super spreader uh, environments. 
And then there's the structure of the Italian healthcare system, which has a certain degree of similarity to ours, except for the fact that it is socialized medicine. But it, the, the healthcare systems are, are actually decentralized. They're centralized within the regions. They're not centralized uh, nationally. And then they're further centralized within the provinces, which are like counties within a state here. Um, so there's a great deal of variability in the access to care. And there are pl many small hospitals over there that we call here in the U.S. critical access hospitals. So there are typically maybe one or two ICU beds um, and maybe 30 um, medical and, and um, obstetrics beds. Uh, there are a number of those as well. And then there are the cultural and behavioral issues, which is something that um, people grabbed on right away, actually, because Italians being a very friendly uh, group of people, um, and they traditionally treat each other with a, with a hug and a kiss um, on both cheeks, and that is a great way to spread droplets. So that's definitely part of it. And then also, there is this uh, tradition um, of, that centers around something called forbezia. Forbezia is, is cunningness. It's a, it's a, it's a way to design, a, uh, or it's a, it's, it's actually a mindset that helps people design a way to get around rules. Um, and they see this as great sport, um, by the way. So whoever can trick a system the, you know, better and more efficiently is sort of a winner, um, in the great scheme of things. So if you have these cultural and behavioral issues, which definitely lead to contagion. So there's a flood of data here that creates a great deal of challenge for those of us working in public health data science. So I guess, um, you know, this, it pr should be pretty clear that we have all these different data and we have to bring these, these data together in some sort of an integrated uh, and usable format. It is no mean feat because you have molecular data, of course. You have electronic health record data, which could be structured or unstructured. Um, it could be um, a, a imaging data. And again, this is, this could be the actual images themselves. Um, being read perhaps by a neural network, um, you know, to identify lesions. Uh, you actually probably don't need that when you're looking at a COVID lung, which is pretty dreadful, unfortunately, um, and has lots of, um, lots of lesions in it. It's pretty easy to tell what's going on. But still, those types of, uh, those types of, of uh, artifacts, those documents, those, those images, um, also, also uh, need to be integrated, not just the reports uh, that come from the radiologist. And there's also continuous monitoring, um, all sorts of monitoring of the cardiac status and the pulmonary status and multi-organ um, monitoring as well. Um, Self-report modalities. So for an individual out there at the outside of the hospital, for example, you want to keep track of their contacts. So Italy just now announced or just released a, uh, an application uh, for smartphones called Immuni. And unfortunately, um, it's not going to do much good because it's being only released in the southernmost provinces and, and southernmost regions, actually. Um, but it would be good to be able to do contact tracing. But it's, you know, there is a point in a pandemic when it starts to become a little bit late. Um, but still, also, we want to know about people's cognition and their effective state. Um, and these can be self-reported by uh, cell phones and the like. And then there's the environment, which is huge, um, because we do know, for example, as I mentioned, that nursing home residents are at great risk. And this is um, um, very problematic for elders who already are compromised with, with their morbidities. So where's the role of informatics in all of this? Well, there's data acquisition, of course. We need to get the data. Uh, that's one part of it. But then we have to integrate it. So we think about harmonization. Um, uh, in, from a syntactic uh, um, perspective, meaning do, are we calling the same variable concept the same name? Um, and for the semantics, do we actually mean the same thing? For example, what do we mean about a variable like race? Or what do we mean about a variable like sex or gender? Uh, there's, that's the semantic part. And then there's the warehousing. We have to bring everything together, typically with an extract, transform, and load, either virtually or in a physical warehouse. And then this is where we are, which is the knowledge discovery analytics. So statistical methods, machine learning, natural language, uh, visualization, these are all things that come into play, but we're gonna focus on the statistical and the machine learning for this talk. And the idea here is to ultimately develop a deep phenotype, a deep phenotype of the pandemic. Um, and th th realizing, of course, that this is incredibly multidimensional and this isn't something that's just going to relate to one single flow chart like you would see. Um, it's typically uh, manifested on VKB, uh, which is a site which is supported by the Emerge Project. Uh, as valuable as those are, uh, this particular phenotype is, is multi-multidimensional and would need um, 
I think more sophisticated tools to actually represent it, but at least it could get us to that point to start thinking about this. So once we've processed all the data and once we are arriving at this phenotype, but we're not quite there yet, we can start analyzing to get to that point. And so why do we actually want to characterize this to begin with? I mean, isn't it just sort of going along its merry way? Sure, people are getting sick, they're getting admitted to the hospital. And unfortunately, in Lombardy, we had, you know, a very, a, a very high mortality rate, about 18 um, percent, much, much higher than just about anywhere else in the world. Um, well, the reason why is because you want to you want to determine the incidence. You want to know where the cases are and you want to see where the spread is as a result from that. Um, you're going to look over the, this, the geography here to see if, well, do state boundaries or state borders here in the U.S., do they matter? Does it matter if Pennsylvania has a great masking policy, for example, or a stay home order, but West Virginia or Ohio don't? Well, actually they do, but um, if you, you get my point. A state border doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, so you want to be able to see when the, 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 the um, um, cases of COVID are actually crossing, not just those borders, but even within the state's borders. And from all of this, we also want to understand the contagion dynamics. This is really, really important because a pandemic doesn't just occur as a single slice in time. It occurs over time, as we'll talk about a little bit um, with the, the parameters that we use to measure these dynamics. And it's very, very important to understand these because this, this gives us a sense for the rate of spread, for example, and also to identify covariates which could influence that. And then we want to, from all of this, we want to develop and evaluate methods for containment and mitigation. So um, you probably heard these terms used a fair amount, um, but I just want to give you my spin on these. And I think that, you know, it's very heavily flavored by the response over in Italy, um, which we use pretty much the same definitions here. Uh, containment means you want to keep the cases in a small area. Um, in Lombardy, uh, what happened is we had a shutdown. Um, and the entire region was shut down, literally shut down. Uh, no trains could run, no cars could go to another uh, region, um, no planes were landing. It was, we were shut down. We were kept within the borders of Lombardy. Um, and even before that, there were 11 towns in, um, uh, actually to the east of my town, um, that were also contained the same way for about a week or so before. Um, but then there's mitigation, which is, okay, we can't contain it all. We can at least mitigate. We can at least keep the uh, the impact of this pandemic uh, down to um, a minimum to some extent. And that's where masking comes into play. So containment is more like shutdowns and lockdowns, and mitigation is more about masking. And also, if, if a combination of the two is, is really hand washing and just, you know, good hygiene and social distancing. So let's talk about some of the computational tools. Um, I want to start with the traditional epidemiologic uh, computational approaches, which really focus on disease transmission and spread. That's, that's how us epidemiologists sort of think about these tools, that they're not out there to uh, necessarily uh, uh, prove a hypothesis one way or another, that we really want to characterize this pandemic. So the first thing that we use is an epidemic curve. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm sure many of you have seen this before, um, but these are typically used especially for small outbreaks, not necessarily for pandemics, but we are using them now um, because they are very handy to get a sense for how many cases do we have today, for example, as opposed to yesterday, or how many cases do we have total ever since the beginning of time when we've been um, we have been um, uh, recording these. So we use these to identify, contain, and mitigate the spread of a disease. That These are as, really essential and very primitive tools. It's really nothing more than a plot of the number of, of uh, cases on the vertical axis and the horizontal is typically days. It could be hours. If it's a foodborne outbreak, it's typically hours. Um, but for us in, in, um, in COVID land, it's going to be days typically. And they're indispensable for understanding the incidence Right, because you'll start as these incident cases, the newly found cases, will add to the data point that gets plotted for that particular day. But then also the rate of transmission that we can look at the slope of the of the um, of the curve to get a good sense for the rate. It's very crude to think about it that way because epidemic curves are re are very much reliant on reporting, and many of you probably have heard that reporting is very very spotty. Um, it's delayed often as much as a week to 10 days from the time a person's um, throat and nasopharynx is swabbed. 
Um, and then on top of that, we have concerns about a false positive rate with, with the, uh, the PCR test and even more with the antibodies um, that if there's, or the serology. And then, you know, like on top of that, then there is also the, the question of technique. Uh, doing a nasopharynx swab is difficult when you have an uncooperative patient um, because it's a very uncomfortable procedure and, and most people, their tendency is to buck away. Um, so it's, it's sometimes it's difficult to get a really good swab. So, but we are relying on those data now to help us to understand about the transmission, to identify the hot spots, and develop and and uh, and a development of the of policies which will lead to containment and mitigation, and possibly resource allocation too, which was a huge issue here for the U.S. as you know, as it was in Italy too, for that matter. Okay, so here is an example. This is a wonderful site. Um, I strongly recommend you go to this. This is from the visualcapitalist.com, um, and I'm going to bring it up actually, so we can actually see what this looks like. Um, th th you can highlight a curve, right? These curves here represent the number of cases from the time when the very first case, the day the very first case was reported, all the way out to 140 days after. Okay, so this is all well and good, but we can animate this. And there's China. And Italy will be in there right behind it. There's South Korea. There's Italy. And unfortunately, there is the United States. So remember, these are sheer counts. This is not a rate, this is not a proportion. But, but speaking of transmission rate, or speaking of the dynamics of the of the um, um, of the pandemic at the, any one point in time, we can get a pretty good sense for this. For example, we can see in Australia they did a pretty good job of what's called flattening the curve. And by the way, I, I, I like to bring this up every time I talk about curve flattening, because I think it's sometimes misunderstood that oh, this is going to reduce the overall incidence. No, that's actually not its intent. Um, and the intent of the of the flattening the curve campaign is to actually reduce and spread out the drain on healthcare systems. Because this, this is the point right here, the early uh, exponential rise in these curves is the point where the, uh, the strain on uh, existing healthcare systems is the highest. And so that's just something to, uh, to remember about these curves. But we can get a good sense for something about the dynamics. We can see that the growth actually of the US was very, very steep. It had an extraordinarily high rate Right, so it was a lot of contagion going on, not just in terms of numbers, but in terms of the rate of that contagion as well. Whereas some of the other countries, maybe not so much, like Brunei, no. Okay, so let's go back over here. So this was my town, this was in Pavia, um, and we locked down on the 9th of March. Um, I personally put myself in quarantine on the 1st of March um, because um, I knew enough about this at that point re to realize that, uh, no, <laughs> we're in big trouble and I'm not going home. <laughs> so I just stayed there, locked in the whole time um, until uh, the 15th. Uh, but they, they actually locked the city down based solely on the epidemic curve. So what you see here is a, is a, a, a street called Corso Cavorter. It's a big, it's a main street here in, Italy, in uh, Pavia and it's virtually empty. And that picture was taken on, on March 12th. So we wonder, you know, are there better approaches to this um, than just doing the epidemic curve? So we do have something else. We have the compartment model, which, and this is something called the SEIR model, the susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered. These are four compartments here that you see. Um, and so somebody can move from the susceptible compartment to the exposed compartment, depending on, you know, maybe he shook hands or, you know, in Italy, he gave somebody a hug and a kiss and to, to an exposed person, then that, that susceptible would now become exposed. And if that person who was kissed was infected, this person who was exposed could easily move to the next compartment. Okay, and then ultimately we want to see people recover. So here, here is an example of the SEIR, uh, uh, SEIR model um, showing the progression from um, one compartment to the next. And um, I will leave these these up here just to, to take a look at here, but just to keep in mind that there is a, uh, a death rate 
and a birth rate, at least a birth rate in the very beginning. Um, but there is um, a death rate that could be uh, could happen. People could die being exposed or being infected or even just being susceptible. Um, and that, then there's also a recovery rate, which influences transition from infected to recovered, just like there is an incubation rate. That's 14 days, typically two to 14 days for COVID, right? And then coming back over here, this is the transmission rate, okay? So this is um, all well and good. We can get rate equations from all of this. In other words, how do we determine the transition from susceptible to exposed and from exposed to infected? And these are the formulas that do that or the equations, but they're finite difference equations, so they don't really account for time here. They're just a simple uh, count, basically, uh, data, really. So if we take the derivative of each one of these uh, equations, um, we can model the dynamics of the disease outbreak. And we, what we get from that is the reproduction number, or R0. R0 is, uh, that represents the number of cases that one case generates on average over the course of an infectious period. And it's, it's very useful for modeling disease spread. So the R0, and uh, for most of, um, uh, well, actually for Italy right now, um, is, is uh, far less than one. Uh, the infection is dying out. They've had only 122 cases last, uh, or just yesterday, for the previous 24 hours. That's very exciting to say the least, when the number was typically uh, in, the, um, in the thousands um, for, for months. Um, if R0 is equal to one, then there's a steady state. And then if R0 is greater than one, the infection will spread. Okay, so containment. This is a typhoid Mary. She's been contained and she was contained here actually twice. This is North Brother Island right off of the Bronx in New York. Um, and th th these were the days when we would, we would isolate patients who had a, con a contagious disease in typically government run hospitals. And this is certainly no exception. Um, it was run by the city. Um, and th there are plenty of the examples of these uh, types of containment facilities. Nowadays, we don't do that much, except to keep the people in hospital when they need care. So here's an example, and I've got several of these papers just to very briefly introduce to, to underline what, what each one of these methods does. This is one that was done by a colleague of ours at Penn, um, Gary Weissman, um, who is um, and also an informatician at heart, I must say, um, using a compartment model to inform a simulation of hospital capacity. In other words, I wanted to find out if, if what is it going to take for the hospitals for the University of Pennsylvania in particular to get um, to the point where they can't handle any more patients? This, of course, was a huge problem in Lombardy where they were treating patients in parking lots in tents um, and in, in hallways in clinics. Um, so, and they did find that uh, they came up with a number of 31 to 53 days before the demand exceeded existing hospital capacity. So this is an example of using R0 for planning purposes, um, a really, really interesting and um, uh, nice, nice application. By the way, they did not use the SEIR model. They just used the variant, which is susceptible, infected, and, re and uh, recovered, which is fine. There are plenty of variants of these compartment models, by the way. Okay, so onto the statistical approaches, which I think tend to focus a bit more on forecasting and prediction. And I just want to mention a couple um, because these have come up in the news very frequently, um, but they're definitely worth looking at, um, I think, on your own time to get a better understanding of why these things were so controversial. Um, and they were. This one in particular, this one's the one that comes from Seattle at the University of Washington. Um, the the um, uh, model focuses on the trajectory of COVID-related deaths. And that uses a statistical framework with a mixed effects nonlinear regression and mixture models. And but it, the, and the the novelty here is the application, um, and and it, it's just you know like a, re, a really good application actually, um, and especially based on real time data. Um, and it does not use a compartment model here; it's strictly a, a statistical approach. Um, but it underestimated the number of deaths. And you probably know that this model is the one that informed um, the policy that came from the White House early on. And then there's the Imperial College model, another famous model. This is a semi-mechanistic Bayesian hierarchical model, which estimates changes in the R0 using retrospective data to obtain the priors, which you need for the Bayesian model, and to estimate the changes in the infection rate. And the focus here was on non-drug intervention strategies, which is quite interesting. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons, though, why it's controversial, because they promoted large-scale lockdowns. And so, and needless to say, they really fought against this in the UK until um, 
uh, until the prime minister found himself in the hospital and having to deal with with acute illness from COVID. And um, I think the realization was oh, we have to do more than just think about approaching this from a, um, a very laissez-faire attitude. But, and as a result, though, it was highly politicized as well. So here's another one that I offer um, as I, I think a really good um, a really good um, um, alternative to these. This is the COVID lab model. This comes from the Policy Lab at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, that uh, a number of our colleagues at Penn are, are working on and some in our own department as well. Um, it, it takes data from the census, typically the American, or specifically the American Community Survey, but also the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, which is important because part of what they're modeling here is distancing and other behaviors and weather, which is incredibly important. And I'll talk about why that's important a little bit later. I've already hinted, I think, in terms of uh, Lombardy's experience. Um, but they use a distributed lag, nonlinear mix, mixed effects model, and they focus on small area analyses, which is what you see here. These are distancing um, policies that you see, distancing policies in effect. Yes, Cape May County had no policy for, for, uh, for distancing down there. Um, but you can see here Philadelphia and, of course, the surrounding counties did as well. So. A little more, another take on social distancing. Um, this is actually a, these guys are the uh, part of the Philharmonia from La Scala in Milan, and they are going to be giving a concert this this weekend. Um, that if the, this link right here, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it's free that you can hear. They're going to be doing this um, um, virtually, so you might want to tune in. They're going to be doing works of the primarily of the Baroque. Okay such as performing arts now, as you probably know. Um, so machine learning, and, and here the focus, I think, is, is more on classification and prediction, which are often used for machine learning um, applications. And, and here's a good example. This is a machine learning approach to investigating the impact of environment on COVID-19. And they wanted to look at a bunch of different environmental parameters in classifying COVID-19. They looked at data from four cities in Italy, and you'll notice that they come from four different um, um, regions, as a matter of fact. Um, so you, you've got Milan, Turin, um, Venice, and Bologna. And they, uh, they looked at the daily average temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, population density, and then they use confirmed um, COVID-19 as the outcome in a supervised machine learning um, method that was actually based on an artificial neural network, but they optimized the, the, the uh, parameterization on um, using particle swarm optimization, which is a naturally inspired method that, that uh, looks at swarm intelligence um, as, as a way to, um, uh, for optimization or optimizing functions. And they also use a differential evolution algorithm, um, not unlike a genetic algorithm to, um, to, to parameterize the network. And all of the methods came up, or both of those methods came up um, with the population density and humidity being the strongest predictors of COVID-19. And I've heard humidity come up time and again in a number of different uh, projects that I've been working on in COVID. Um, it does seem to be a major uh, issue. And then here's another one, um, looking at environmental assessment for curve flattening. Um, and this is to develop an AI-driven um, mobilization strategy for mobile assessment agents for epidemics and pandemics. The agents in this case were, were simulated, so it's sort of like agent-based modeling, but it's, it's actually intended to translate directly to people who are going to go out and do contact tracing and to, to ass make assessments in the, on, the, on the, the ground. So they used a self-organizing feature map um, and not totally unrelated to uh, neural network architecture, trained using uh, data from past mobile crowd sensing campaigns to model mobility patterns of individuals in multiple districts of the city. And they found that on the 15th day, following the first confirmed case in the city under the risk of community spread, AI-enabled mobilization of assessment centers can reduce the unassessed population size down to one-fourth of the unassessed population under the case when assessment agents are randomly deployed over the city. Again, a major policy implication for that. Okay, so there's more. Um, so it, we often don't think of social media as being computational, but yes. Um, and this was, compu this was social media in 1918, I'm afraid. Um, it was a flyer that uh, back in, um, in this this was distributed. Actually, that would be nineteen. Uh, yeah, nineteen nineteen. Sorry, um, 
and this this um, was just distributed to uh, people in San Francisco to come to the anti-mask meeting, and hopefully uh, nobody got shot there. Okay, so the internet internet search behavior is one way to look at this. You can use Google Trends to find out what people are searching for, and they use linear regression and long short-term memory models, which are a form of recurrent neural network. Um, to um, actually predict incidents um, based on what people were looking for. And what is it they found? Well, people were looking for hand washing, um, hand washing frequency, uh, use of hand sanitizer and antiseptics. I'm actually surprised that they also didn't see hand lotion or moisturizer if they, but, you know, because people who are washing their hands a lot probably do need that. Um, so another one here is social media is an early warning system for COVID incidents. We've done this kind of work in pharmacovigilance for a number of years, and it's very interesting to see it applied here. Uh, this was the Weibo social media pl uh, uh, platform that's used in China, and they looked at 15 million different posts, and they compared them um, for um, across the country along separately with Hubei province, which is where Wuhan is. And the, the reports of the symptoms and the diagnosis of COVID-19 significantly predicted the daily case counts case of official statistics. So there's a lot to learn there from these. And by the way, I should mention, I've only picked articles from, um, from the, from the uh, peer reviewed literature. I haven't um, uh, taken anything from archive, although there is bound to be plenty in there with their 35 or so hundred uh, COVID related articles in just in med archive alone. But let's turn to agents and then we can have some time for questions. Um, so agents, um, is, this focuses here on simulation and primarily simulation of behavior and behavior occurring within a dynamical system. And there is no better, um, I think, example of a dynamical system than a pandemic like COVID, um, where you there is nonlinear, um, but it's also not really totally exponential either. Um, there is a certain um, underlying chaotic function, which probably describes it best. And there are people I know who are looking at this. So it's uh, something to to keep in mind about the value for agent-based models is that they are particularly good at simulating these types of systems. Here's an example of social distancing, which didn't really work. This was in Milan um, back in, in uh, May. Um, right after they started lifting a little bit of the of the restrictions, uh, you'll see nobody is wearing masks, um, which is sort of crazy because they they were good, they were subject to a fine of 400 euros if they got caught. Um, but also, there's no social distancing there either. But think of each of those as an agent. So here's a paper that actually looked at an agent-based model simulation of of COVID-19 transmission in facilities and specifically nursing homes. And they, they wanted to simulate this, this spatiotemporal transmission, right? This is something that is harder to get to, to some extent, with your, your traditional epi or your stats or even just your basic machine learning models, too. You can use all of those to inform the development of an agent-based model. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind here, that these things don't just sort of grow on trees, that an agent-based model is informed by those types of uh, heuristics and also data. Right, so they had data um, showing, uh, describing the infection spread and spatial characteristics. Much too much to put in here, um, to, to on a single slide. But they sh they found useful information to produce strategies for reducing transmission risks, so that they could actually model each individual agent separately and then in combination with other um, agents in the environment. So we're going to take a look at one here. Um, Hope this will work. There, this is in NetLogo. NetLogo is a um, is one of many agent-based modeling platforms, and I just want to show you here. We're going to set this up. This is San Marino, which is an independent prov provinciality in um, in Italy. It's not part of Italy. It's its own separate country, basically. And we're going to start the simulation where we we're just going to take the defaults here, where we can say the chance of infection is fairly low. Uh, but the chance of death, let's say, is really quite high in people who are 80 and maybe a little bit higher in people who are 70 to 80. And the chance of infection yeah, maybe a little bit higher because they're in nursing homes, right? So we could do that. And I'm going to reset that up again. And then we're going to do this. We're going to go. Those are pockets of infection in San Marino. And if you could drill down. You could take a look at this. You could also set a whole host of other parameters that you see here that show actually um, a fair amount of contagion. And we're going to take a look at the graph here.
and you will see that the infection for the age group, you see the green, that's 60 to 80 plus. These, that, that infection rate um, is, is really high. The incidence is, is very high over time. So, you know, what can you do with this? Well, you can certainly implement some um, um, interventions like, okay, well, let's, let's implement a masking uh, policy or maybe a no visitation policy in a nursing home. Um, and there are quite a few things that you could do with this kind of a model. And you can see how much it would reduce and actually quantify that reduction and produce a, um, you know, a, a document, a, a report on this to our uh, making policy. Okay, probably should stop that. Okay. Okay, just so, just to summarize. So there are many different ways to investigate a pandemic, and I've, only, I've gone over just a few of these, actually, larger families, um, but certainly many um, individual instances within each of these categories uh, that we haven't had a chance to discuss. So, um, and I, I think that, you know, by looking through this, though, I think you can see it's probably uh, pretty close to set covering in terms of the large categories. But we need, what we do need is more meta ensemble methodologies. And I'm borrowing a term here from machine learning. An ensemble is when you put, a, you know, like more than just one machine learning method together and you can wrap them like a wrapper type of method is one way to do this. Um, so that you've got information from one machine learner going over to another machine learner. In other words, they work together sort of as a community, sometimes linearly, sometimes not. Sometimes they are a lot more, um, um, Nonlinear, actually, so that the the, um, the things that are learned from one learner don't just pass on to the next learner in the in the ensemble, and then it just like disappears. It uh, information can go back to the first learner. So agent and rich compartment models um, is definitely one, um, and I just showed you one right here. Um, but th that was actually a compartment model enriched agent based system. So what I'm talking about is an agent enriched compartment model so that those parameters that I showed you on this SEIR model could actually, that might only be just a small part of what's really important. And in fact, it is a small part because behavior is not included in there. There are no behavioral components or, or variables in that entire chain. Um, and so that's that's one thing to keep in mind. Also, the heterogeneity. Agent-based systems are really good on heterogeneous, heterogeneous representations. SEIR or any compartment model is not. It's assumed that there is no heterogeneous mixing in a compartment. Um, and then machine learning enriched social media agents is another. And advanced statistical classifiers applied to real-time context, uh, context. And it's not over yet. There's it's. Um, you know, COVID-19, that's still going on. Um, and we don't have the end to the novel computational methods development. There is still plenty of room. There's a huge sandbox with regard to how much data that we've got and how much is being produced daily. And then computational methods are, are being rethought and re-engineered um, and new ones are being introduced virtually every day. But the question is, is what do we do with all these, um, all these models and results? And I think that that's um, an open question and largely, hopefully it feeds into policy and behavior change and a reduction in the impact of, of, a, um, of a, a, a pandemic like this in the future. Okay, I think if I'm not mistaken, I have to hand my slide off. Right, there we are. Okay, well, thank you all very much for your patience. Um, I, I know this was something of a whirlwind tour. Um, we, we could easily have spent um, several hours on each one of those uh, five areas. And um, it, it, all of them have room for, uh, for exploration, as I mentioned before. So I am happy to entertain questions. And I think the way this is going to work is that if you post them, Right, questions should be going through the email right here on the slide. And then they will be sent to me. Okay, and then I will read these one at a time. So uh, a question for me, 
What kinds of epidemiologic questions do you think we will be able to answer from the pooled EHR data sets such as N3C or NCATS or, or the ACT Consortium? This is a really, really uh, good question. Um, first of all, I'm very much involved with N3C and other, method, other um, um, approaches to pooling data like this. Um, so the question is, is, is how granular are the data? This is the big question. You know, people have been have been um, clamoring for for uh, contact tracing. But, well, the epidemiologists have anyway, um, and the reason for this is because it really gives you a very good low level granular, um, um, I think, um, representation of who's doing what out there in the world, and who are they meeting, and how much time are they spending with them, et cetera. And we don't have that level of granularity in any of these data sets, I'm afraid. Um, we're not going to be able to do contact tracing with these data sets, so we'll take that off the table. But there, there are other ones, though. We could, we, if we were able to get, and again, some of these um, data sites are, are, uh, or data initiatives are not going to give us this either, unfortunately, but it would be great to have, have them all geocoded. And I mean, not geocoded coarsely just for a city um, or, or zip coded or anything like that. I, I think it would be a really important thing to be able to get low-level geocoded data down to the census tract. If not, then the census block. And the reason for that is because then we probably could proxy um, something that looked like a contact trace. Um, it wouldn't be the same, but it would be, you know, it, an interesting thing to look at. Um, but that said, we can still get a lot of incidence data and we can get our cumulative, um, cumulative incidence, which is what those epidemic curves that I showed you actually model or, or indicate. Um, so, in other words, the number of cases which have been identified ever since the beginning of record keeping on the pandemic, um, and the old ones don't go away even if they've recovered, they're still represented in the curve. We can still plot those, that would be good. And we could still do this by perhaps by maybe institution, um, that would be another one. Um, and I think that, um, I think that I think that we're the, the, it becomes it becomes a uh, um, a real question I think for how far we can actually go with this. So I have another message or another another question. Many of us, um, I think this one's from Brian Dixon at Regan Street. Uh, hi, Brian. Many of us have been have been trying to account not only for age differences but also race, social determinants, and comorbid conditions. Are you aware of any good models that do address these factors? to reliably predict COVID-19 outbreaks or impacts on outcomes like hospitalization and or death. So, of course, the, these, these uh, the, the categories or the, the of, ra of, of, of uh, variables that you're talking about here, race, social determinants and comorbid conditions are really thorny and difficult, um, especially race, because we're not really sure what that means. Um, and we're not really sure how well it's collected. I can tell you on the European data, they don't collect race. Uh, so it's just not available. Um, so, but so, and social determinants, you have to proxy these from environmental data. So again, this gets down to the data integration problem. And I think that this goes back to the first question too. We're going to have to do that. Um, so I, I think that I don't know of any good models that currently address all of those factors. I do know that social determinants are being covered in that, um, in the COVID-19 lab. Um, at CHOP, at Children's Hospital, where they're looking at, at, um, um, at a number of social determinants in addition to distancing. Um, and it would be interesting to see about the influence of, of um, social determinants of health, especially with regard to neighborhood characteristics and, and possibly race, um, possibly SES and the, um, and the uptake of, um, of what we think of as, as, um, as good distancing practice. So, but I think that what, what I presented here is a very good um, opportunity to explore those, especially with the, the, uh, uh, the more machine learning, uh, statistical classification and, and um, agent-based models. So another question, um, this one is um, a really good one. <laughs> Did the CDC add a COVID-19 module to the BRF assessor risk factor surveillance system 
um, which is a, um, a survey which is given out um, every year. It's run by the states, but it's actually curated by the feds at the National Center for Health Statistics at the CDC. I don't know if they've asked anything about this. It's probably too early uh, to tell, but I would say that there could be. Um, the people who run the BRFIS are very amenable to, to uh, questions being added. It goes through a committee and they it does have to get vetted and it shows up um, and maybe not necessarily as an entire module, but probably a set of questions within a module, um, because certainly there are some really interesting questions um, to answer there. And this could actually get at the, at the, uh, the point from the previous question about social determinants and, um, and behavioral risk factors uh, with regard to um, um, with regard to outcomes and with regard to perceptions. So, and uh, by the way, I should mention too that there is a, there is a project that I'm working on right now with one of my colleagues, Karen Glantz at, at uh, Penn, where we are uh, surveying about 1,500 folks uh, throughout the country um, to get a handle on their, their beliefs and attitudes. And we're going to do a conjoint analysis on this to, uh, to, to figure out their, their uh, beliefs and attitudes with respect to, to um, uh, mitigation procedures and specifically mask wearing, washing hands, things of that nature. Uh, another question is, could the multi-dimensional could the multi-dimensional pandemic phenotype be combined with host patient genomic data in order to better characterize super spreading proportions in a population? Absolutely, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And you know, I, I draw your attention um, if you go back to look at this on the recording um, in the, in that that uh, that slide that I animated for you on the uh, on the deep pandemic phenotype. That's the very first thing I brought up was the omics part. That definitely has to be brought into play here because it, it has been really considered, I think now probably for about six to eight weeks and maybe a little bit earlier in, in Europe, that there was something going on genetically with the, the people who were asymptomatic and also with people who were exposed and never, never, uh, never converted um, and never got a positive test. So positively, these things have to be brought into play. And let me see here. There has been significant criticism over the lack of race and ethnicity in the data captured by the states and the federal government. What can be done to improve the completeness or quality of the data during a pandemic to allow for real-time analysis of disparities in infection and outcomes? This is this is a $64,000 question, um, and and I I don't have a good answer for this um, because I think that th this is something which which is which affects even just basic EHR data, right? And that's really a large part of the fault here. Um, it, 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 we still have to figure out what race and ethnicity actually mean. We're still locked into this idea that ethnicity is tied only to hispanicity and um, or as to whether you're a Latino or not, and which is an ancient, ancient uh, definition that goes back literally to the 1950s. Um, and, and so, you know, we have to really rethink this. And the other question is, is okay, well, what, what does race actually matter here? Is it more a matter of, of living circumstances, neighborhood effects, um, familial effects, social capital, those things which are probably heavily influenced by race? And those things probably are much more um, important for looking at COVID than the actual race idea. So I think we have to really give serious consideration to what we mean by this. Um, the next question, are there models that combine health and economic impacts? Yeah, there are people who are working on this um, indeed. And in fact, we're working on that right now at Penn with regard to, um, I don't know that this will ever get published. I hope it will, <laughs> but we're, we're working fr uh, frantically on developing models to determine what our reopening scheme is going to look like when school starts in, at the end of August, uh, because there are very serious economic impacts as you can well imagine. And the health impacts are, of course, very real too. When you're bringing back, you know, thousands of undergraduate and graduate students plus faculty and staff, um, and they're living and working in close quarters, um, there, there's just so many behavioral issues and so many economic issues that go along with this. And of course, the economic impacts are that if we stay completely online, um, you're going to see some movements from students and parents asking for you know a reduction in their tuition <laughs> because it, the, the belief is that online is not as good as, as in person. 
So um, I, I know that we're working on this, and I know that other people are as well. Um, I know uh, uh, Kevin Volpe, who's a, who is a um, MD, PhD in economics at Penn, and um, has done a lot of work in behavioral economics, is very much a part of this exercise too. So um, I'm sure that there are others who are, who are dealing with this. So one more. Um, how do biologists and computational scientists partner in generating and applying these computational tools? What are some success stories? Good question. What resources and approaches help these collaborations to succeed? You know, this is this is something which um, I think is is um, a, first of all, it's a very important question, um, and something that I think points to the fact that we really need to bring in um, the biologists and the computational biologists to into the fold into this whole spectrum of what biomedical informatics is about, and I, I especially at the time of a pandemic when so much of the work that's being done right now is at the wet lab. You know, the most obvious example of this is what's going on with vaccine development. Um, but otherwise too, you know, developing new tests, you know, the whole, um, you know, exercise in putting together the, the um, serology tests and even getting the, uh, the um, um, PCR tests done in the very beginning. Um, we need these folks and they need to be able to, uh, to use these tools um, as they work. Um, and the question is, can we get people to collaborate with them who were from the more computational sciences? And that includes the informaticians, the people who are doing the machine learning and the agent-based modeling, et cetera, to work together with them to think about what the implications are of developing a particular um, um, tool as their, not the computational tool, but using computational tools to assist them in the development of their tools, which whether it's a vaccine or a diagnostic or a screening test. John, uh, this is, can you hear me? This is again. Valerie speaking and I want to, we could listen to you all day and I would, <laughs> but we also promised you that you didn't have to speak all day. So on behalf of all the people who have been listening and the National Library of Medicine, I really want to thank you for doing this after being back for just a week and a couple of days um, to really give us this great overview. And I want to tell people, you know, there, are, there may be other questions piling up. We'll work on how to get those answered for people. There, there's a way. Um, but I also want to remind people that this videocast will be in the NIH videocast past events and they can come back and visit it again. Okay. Great. Okay. So thank well, you. I, I, listen, I thank you again, Valerie, and 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 uh, Patty and David, and uh, and especially all of you who have been listening. And um, I know that these are not necessarily the best way to give a talk. I would much rather be in an auditorium, away from a podium, just walking around and and engaging with everybody. Um, but here we are. This is this is our our life right now. So. Um, John, let me echo the thanks and let me let you know that although this isn't the best way to reach everyone, we did reach almost 500 people with your lecture. Fantastic. And that is a fantastic outreach. So I want to thank all of the people who signed on to hear the lecture. We, it will be archived. We'll be able to go over this again. Um, I'm going to be uh, generous and invite uh, you to write to John directly if you have technical questions for him. But this, sure. this I have to thank David and uh, Valerie, I'm the one that pushed a little harder on this, and I appreciate how hard they worked to make it work so well. Thank you so much for being our first inaugural lecture, John. It was terrific. Well, thank you, Patty. The pleasure was really all mine. I really enjoyed this.